so I did actually expand the talk a little bit beyond um, systemic disease in the eye, which we'll, which we'll certainly cover. But I'm also going to discuss, uh, as Dr. Luxa mentioned, uh, some drugs and their effects on the eye, but also just some of the exciting things that we're doing right now in ophthalmology for those of you who haven't uh, had much exposure lately to, to ophthalmology and all the fun things that we get to do. So to start off, as you might imagine, any type of systemic disease can affect the eye, but there are a few that I'm gonna focus on either because of their importance to ophthalmology or just because they have some interesting findings uh, that we get to see. And the first is uh, neurofibromatosis. And um, I have a nice picture here of the Lish nodules on the iris that we can see. Interestingly, they're actually of no, no effect in terms of uh, in terms of vision or pathology in the eye, but they can be really helpful in terms of the diagnosis of the disease. There are some serious problems that can occur in the eye with neurofibromatosis, whether it's uh, fibromas in the lid or tumors in the optic nerve or, or in the retina. But the uh, the Lish nodules are sort of fun when we uh, when we get a chance to find them. Hypertension, as you might imagine, uh, both the severity and duration of the disease can affect uh, what we see. Uh, in the eye with uh, hypertensive retinopathy. And this is a good example of a patient who has the uh, so-called copper wiring of the retinal arterioles, as well as a lot of flame-shaped hemorrhages and exudates from leakage from the, from the blood vessels in the, in the posterior part of the retina. In amaurosis, um, that is a monocular, and that's an important distinction, monocular dimming of the vision due to a temporary obstruction of the um, arterioles, and it, it's painless as well. To refresh everyone's memory about the anatomy, the ophthalmic artery is a, a branch off of the internal carotid, and then that ultimately will lead to the central retinal artery. And we can get emboli in either of those locations, either in the ophthalmic artery or in the central retinal artery itself. And this is a nice picture of the, the Holland horse plaques, the, the emboli that we can sometimes see in patients who have developed uh, an arterial obstruction. Another good example of an uh, embolus right here uh, in the vessel adjacent to the optic nerve. As you might imagine, when this is diagnosed, it does require a, a multidisciplinary approach whether it's with uh, our cardiovascular colleagues, um, our neurosurgical colleagues, and us all working together to try to manage these patients. If there is a, an obstruction in the central retinal artery that does not clear, then we get the picture of a central retinal artery occlusion, or CRAO. And this is a pretty classic picture of a CRAO to contrast with the appearance of the normal fundus. And I think you can appreciate how pale the retina looks here. And it does have this classic so-called cherry red spot right in the center of the fovea. The reason that you still get perfusion there is that that particular area is perfused by the choroidal vessels rather than the, the retinal vasculature. So you still can see that, but the remainder of the retina is very pale in a CRAO. You can also get an obstruction in the central retinal vein, and that produces this very different appearance where you get this diffuse hemorrhaging throughout the retina, the so-called pizza pie appearance. And that's uh, very classic for a central retinal vein occlusion. A variety of hematologic problems can certainly affect the eye as well. Hyperviscosity syndromes, thrombocytopenia, anemia, particularly uh, of interest to us is sickle cell anemia. And it can cause a form of amaurosis and sometimes permanent visual loss as well. This is a, a patient with a, a hyperviscosity uh, syndrome, and I think you can appreciate how dilated and tortuous all of the retinal veins are. And this patient is a setup for long-term problems in terms of the vision because these are not normal vessels and they're not gonna get normal perfusion of the retina. In sickle cell, the, the findings are due to uh, occlusions of the uh, retinal arterioles. So uh, in this picture on the left, you can see this, uh, these big areas of, uh, of ischemia and necrosis due to occlusion of these vessels. And you can see here where the, the arrows are conveniently placed that the, the vessels are completely closed off. I mean, there's no perfusion there whatsoever. 
when you do have areas of the retina that aren't perfused, ultimately new vessels grow in that area, uh, neovascularization. And in sickle cell, they typically take this really interesting so-called C-fan pattern of the, of the neovascularization. And that's, that's a, a picture that's really classic for a sickle cell retinopathy. Malignancies involving the eye um, can certainly get primary malignancies, ocular melanoma, primary ocular lymphomas, as well as metastases. And metastases are the most common intraocular malignancy in adults. They are often asymptomatic, although they sometimes patients can present with, with decreased or distorted vision. And often in these situations, we can see a picture like this. So this is a, a large uh, metastatic lesion uh, beneath the retina in a patient. Can sometimes be one large lesion like this. I'd say more commonly we see multiple small lesions like this in patients who do have metastases to the eye. And, Sometimes, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, we can be the, the first physicians who can diagnose metastases in, in some patients that they, they present to us primarily. <clears throat> A variety of autoimmune disorders uh, can affect the eye. Uh, connective tissue diseases, thyroid, myasthenia, uh, GCA. By far, the most common manifestation of all of these are dry eyes, um, symptoms including burning, foreign body sensation, photophobia, and I'll talk more about uh, dry eye a little bit later in the talk. With uh, ankylosing spondylitis, classically, but um, many other rheumatologic diseases, we can certainly get ocular symptoms, particularly if the patient develops iritis, which again, classically is with ankylosing spondylitis. The kind of symptoms that they may complain to you about are photophobia, redness, perhaps decreased vision. When these patients present with that, that's something that we definitely should take a look at to see if there is in fact uh, evidence of inflammation either in the anterior chamber or in the vitreous. Rheumatoid can cause all kinds of problems in the eyes. In addition to the dry eye, we can get episcleritis and scleritis. We can see corneal ulcers as well as a variety of different types of uveitis. And just to show you some examples of these conditions. So this is a, a rheumatoid patient with a nodular scleritis. And even in two dimensions, I, I think you can appreciate that there's a large nodule here uh, on the sclera. And this is a patient with scleromalation, so-called, where there's a severe degree of scleral thinning in a rheumatoid patient. This uh, dark color that you see is actually from the choroid, which normally we can't see uh, under the retina, but because the sclera has thinned so much, you can actually see the color of the choroid coming through in this large area. And this is a patient who's going to have very, very serious problems if this thins out any further. We also unfortunately can get so-called uh, PUK, peripherative, uh, per peripheral ulcerative keratitis in rheumatoid patients. And this is a big, big problem for us in terms of management. I mean, not only does there tend to be a large area of ulceration in the cornea, it's very difficult to treat. It can continue to thin to the point that you can get a corneal perforation. In addition to some of the, the local things that we can do, we often uh, rely on you all for uh, systemic immunosuppression to, uh, to try to treat these lesions. Uh, lupus also can have a variety of manifestations, dry eyes, scleritis. They can also get peripheral ulcers, but the um, most prominent things that we can see are retinopathy and optic neuropathy. And this is a, a good example of a patient with a, a lupus retinopathy. You can see these areas of ischemia, uh, these exudates that have uh, that have leaked from the from the vessels, and then this is a patient with a pretty prominent swollen nerve uh, from a, a lupus optic neuropathy. GCA is something that uh, that we're always concerned about in in a variety of patients. I know you all are familiar with all of the systemic symptoms to be on the lookout for. What we want to avoid is ending up with a situation like this, which is this chronic nerve pallor uh, in a patient with, uh, with GCA that, that wasn't detected. 
sometimes the symptoms can be as mild as maybe some, some ptosis and some mild complaints around the eye itself. To diagnose it, obviously the history, blood work, and then a temporal artery biopsy. And the key thing in terms of management of GCA is that you should begin treatment with high dose steroids before you get the biopsy. Uh, in terms of the ocular effects and the, the permanent loss of vision, time really is of the essence. So if you're suspicious of GCA, start treating them, then arrange for the, for the biopsy. If it turns out it's negative, you can always stop treatment, but you very well may be able to, to save a patient's vision by getting started on treatment quickly. Thyroid, as I'm sure everyone is aware, can cause a variety of problems in the eye. The, the thing that's vexing for us and for the you in endocrinology is that a lot of times the eye findings are not very well correlated with the serum thyroid levels and can continue to progress after thyroid function itself is normal. And among the, the many things that we can see are, is eyelid retraction, proptosis, uh, strabismus due to dysfunction of the extraocular muscles, corneal exposure, which can become quite severe, uh, a lot of erythema of the conjunctiva, and if there's congestion within the orbit that's compressing the optic nerve can uh, cause severe uh, optic nerve dysfunction as well. So just some examples of a patient here with proptosis, uh, here with uh, pretty boggy eyelids due to soft tissue involvement uh, in thyroid disease. More severely, this patient has extreme corneal exposure in both eyes. And this is, this is a patient that's gonna have some very bad problems long-term. And then a, a patient with compression of the nerve causing uh, swelling of the nerve. Uh, this is just a, a scan of a patient with uh, thyroid ophthalmopathy. And you can see the very enlarged medial rectus muscles in both eyes compared to the normal width lateral rectus. Treatment on our end uh, involves uh, tear substitutes, uh, sometimes steroids, sometimes either radiation or surgical decompression if there's orbital involvement. And we now also have uh, infusion with uh, teprotumabab or tepeza, which uh, does work quite well at uh, calming down the, um, the signs and symptoms of thyroid ophthalmopathy in patients with more severe involvement. It's expensive. But, uh, but it does work. More long-term, when patients are in the cicatricial phase, usually surgery is necessary. So it could be lid surgery, could be muscle surgery if they're left with um, some permanent strabismus from the extraocular muscle involvement or orbital surgery. Sarcoidosis, two main things that we can see in the eye is a sort of classic so-called granulomatous uveitis. And what that means is, in addition to just seeing the cells in the anterior chamber, which is true of any type of uveitis, with a granulomatous uveitis, you can see these deposits of white cells on the uh, inner layer of the cornea as well. And then so-called candle wax drippings in the, uh, in the choroid. And I think you can make out scattered throughout the, the retina are these little white droppings there. And those are really the two classic findings that we see in sarcoid. HIV can have a variety of manifestations in the eye, uh, including dry eye, cotton wool spots, CMV retinitis, Kaposi's sarcoma of either the eyelid or conjunctiva. Historical note, Kaposi's sarcoma of the conjunctiva was first described in a case report from our department several decades ago. And this is a, a HIV patient with uh, some cotton wool spots uh, in the retina. Thankfully, this picture, we really don't see much at all anymore. Uh, this is CMV retinitis. Uh, used to be, we saw this a lot. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, David Wagner, who's a retina specialist, was doing gancyclovir implants. I feel like it was on a daily basis. Maybe it wasn't quite that frequently, but quite often. Now, uh, thanks to all the, the medications that you all have, this is almost unheard of. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk uh, briefly about some systemic medications and how they affect the eye. Uh, 
Optic neuropathy can be seen in a variety of things, classically with the Famutol. Retinopathy also in a variety. The one I want to highlight here is uh, Plaquenil. Uh, it is really important to make sure that all of your Plaquenil patients are seeing us for, um, for monitoring because with Plaquenil, when retinal toxicity occurs, it is irreversible and can be severe. So they really need to see us for exams, for testing. We uh, do OCT testing to, to take a look to see if there's any thinning of the retina. We do visual field testing to see if there's any subtle uh, losses of the, of the central visual field. But it's really critically important because if we can detect this and they can be changed to a different medication, we can preserve their vision. Corneal changes are also seen in a variety of conditions, uh, amiodarone. Uh, more recently, we certainly see some pretty significant dry eyes in patients on um, Dupixent. And then most recently, we've been involved with um, uh, some of your colleagues uh, who are treating patients with, uh, with Blenrep. And what this can cause, and I have seen this a uh, number of times already, are some cystic changes in the cornea, which uh, can be visually significant. Fortunately, if, if the patients are able to be taken off the medication, those cysts do gradually go away. Now, a big one, diabetes and its effect on the eye. Obviously, the, the big thing for us is diabetic retinopathy, which is the lead, still, to this day, the leading cause of blindness in working age Americans. A couple of studies that I just wanted to mention, um, one being the, the DCCT study. And what this did was look at the effect of intensive glucose control on patients who started at baseline in various stages of retinopathy. So patients who had no baseline retinopathy and were able to achieve really excellent glucose control had a 27% reduction in developing any form of retinopathy over time and a 76% reduction in the risk of developing progressive severe retinopathy. So obviously quite important for these patients to, to do the best they can in controlling their blood sugars. In patients who already started with mild to moderate retinopathy, there was a 54% reduction in progression to severe retinopathy or a progression of retinopathy at all and a 47% reduction in the development of severe proliferative retinopathy, almost a 60% reduction in the need for, for laser surgery. Concomitant control of the blood pressure is also very important in terms of lowering the risk of diabetic retinopathy. Interestingly, um, the development of proliferative retinopathy is a risk indicator in these patients for the development of MIs, strokes, ultimate need for an amputation, and also elevates the risk of developing nephropathy as well. So what, what causes diabetic retinopathy? The elevated blood glucose eventually stimulates the production of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, which ultimately leads to increased permeability of the retinal capillaries and abnormal vasoproliferation. And these are the two things that cause the vision loss. So diabetic retinopathy is divided into non-proliferative and proliferative phases. The early signs of non-proliferative retinopathy are microaneurysms in the retina, hard exudates, which is lipid that has uh, leaked out from the, from the blood vessels, and intraretinal hemorrhages. And not infrequently, these patients are asymptomatic, which is why, obviously, it's important for us to do routine exams on diabetic patients because they can have the early stages of retinopathy without any symptoms at all. Uh, here's some pictures of the, the hard exudates, the lipid that has, that has leaked out. And then I think you can appreciate these little microaneurysms of the, uh, of the retinal vessels as well. Uh, hemorrhaging, uh, either the so-called dot blot hemorrhages or these longer flame-shaped hemorrhages are both characteristics. This patient has some cotton wool spots, which are nerve fiber layer infarcts as well. And a good example of a patient with a lot of cotton wool spots. As far as the development of macular edema, which is the, the uh, component of non-proliferative retinopathy that does cause vision loss, 
Uh, patients who have had diabetes less than five years, only about 5% will develop macular edema. More than 15 years, 15% will have it, and that percentage does go up with time. And this is a good example. This is just to show you the a normal fundus once again, and then this is a patient with diabetic macular edema. Obviously, in two dimensions, you can't see that the, the macula is swollen, but you can certainly appreciate all of these abnormalities of the heart exudates, the mycoaneurysms, which are causing leakage and ultimately causes fluid to accumulate within the macula, which is the macular edema. Proliferative retinopathy, the, the key sign is neovascularization, most commonly seen around the optic nerve, so-called NVD, neovascularization of the disc. You can also see it elsewhere in the retina, and that's given the clever name NVE, neovascularization elsewhere. And the, the problem with neovascularization, and I've got some pictures here in a second that I'll show you, is that these new vessels that develop are not normal. So ultimately, they're going to bleed. When they bleed, they cause vitreous hemorrhages. Vitreous hemorrhage ultimately leads to a lot of fibrovascular proliferation, scarring on the retina, ultimately traction, which then pulls on the retina and causes some very, very difficult to treat tractional retinal detachments. And that's what can ultimately cause the, the permanent visual loss in proliferative retinopathy. So this is an example of a patient with NVD. I'm not sure how well you can see it, but there are definitely abnormal vessels. They usually come in these sort of wavy kind of fronds uh, that you can see scattered in various locations around the optic disc. And then this is a patient with the NVE, the neovascularization elsewhere, same type of appearance, but farther out from the optic nerve. This is a pretty classic appearance of a patient with a vitreous hemorrhage. So what happens is those, those abnormal vessels bleed, that blood then gets trapped within the vitreous and gives this uh, so-called boat-shaped hemorrhage uh, that you can see uh, in the vitreous. And this is something that you'd be able to see with your direct ophthalmoscope. Patients with vitreous hemorrhage can have a variety of symptoms. It can present as something as mild as a few floaters and something as severe as a sudden severe loss of vision. Either way, this is something we should take a look at here right away. As I mentioned, this is the ultimate problem, which is this fibrovascular proliferation that, that these patients can get. This will ultimately cause traction on the retina and, uh, and retinal detachments. The other place you can get neovascularization is in the iris, NVI, and this is a patient with a large degree of neovascularization of the iris. And just like in the retina, the problem is that these vessels bleed and will cause uh, hyphema bleeding here in the anterior chamber. For many decades, uh, this was the mainstay of treatment for diabetic retinopathy, whether uh, clinically significant macular edema or proliferative disease, which is laser treatment. And laser treatment is still done sometimes uh, to treat these, pr pr particularly still not infrequently for proliferative disease. But the real mainstay of treatment now are anti-VEGF injections into the vitreous. Uh, I know this looks gruesome, but it, it's actually not as bad as it looks. Uh, so what is done is these, the anti-VEGF compounds, and typically it's uh, bevacizumab, ranibizumab, or a flibercep that we use they're injected into the vitreous and cause regression of these abnormal vessels, of the uh, exudates from the, um, from the retinal vessels and macular edema and can have a really dramatic effect on improvement of the, of the disease. Just to show you that these treatments do work, this is the before and after treatment of a patient with clinically significant macular edema. You can see all the, the exudates and edema here and almost completely resolved. Likewise, for proliferative disease, extensive neovascularization in this whole area surrounding the optic nerve on the slide on the left. And this is a patient who did get uh, laser treatment, panretinal photocoagulation uh, with the laser, and it's quite dramatic how that uh, NVD all can regress with treatment. We do sometimes uh, require surgery in these patients. The surgery that's done is a vitrectomy, and that can be done if there's a persistent vitreous hemorrhage to repair tractional uh, retinal detachments. 
and to allow laser treatment. So when these other things are going on, like a hemorrhage, you can't do laser treatment. So we'll do a vitrectomy to clear things out, which then allows uh, laser treatment to be applied. The vitrectomy is done with um, either two or three incisions in the sclera, uh, one of which has an infusion line, uh, and the other it can be separated or can be combined as in this picture, where there's a, a cutting tip and a suction tip, as well as fiber optic illumination so that the retinal surgeon can see what they're doing as they're uh, mucking around in there. And again, a good before and after picture, same eye, dense vitreous hemorrhage and proliferative disease. And then this is after vitrectomy. Obviously this doesn't look perfect, but much improved post vitrectomy. Now I did want to talk a bit about eye trauma. You know, this is something that you all certainly encounter uh, if you're working in a primary care kind of setting or perhaps in an ED. There are two and a half million eye injuries every year in the US and 40 to 60,000 of them will lead to vision loss. So you know, definitely a significant public health kind of uh, issue. One of the most important ones are chemical burns, which are can be a vision-threatening emergency. And the key thing with chemical burns, regardless of what has caused it, what the eye looks like, irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. That, that, that is what it takes. And if you're the one that's treating this, you just want to put some topical anesthetic in. You do want to take a look for and maybe sweep with a Q-tip to see if there are any foreign bodies that are still in there that might be still you know, exuding some chemical into the eye. And then again, copious irrigation. And this is how it's done, you know, whether, whether it's, uh, it can be as simple as an eye wash, uh, better with, you know, some type of fluid that would be available in, a, in an emergency department or maybe in a primary care office, and just to irrigate the eye like crazy. The other thing that you need to be aware of if you're going to be uh, evaluating these patients primarily is when to be suspicious of a rupture globe. So, Anytime a patient presents with a blunt trauma kind of injury, if it's uh, involved a, a sharp object, metal on metal contact, those are all setups for a rupture globe. And this is a patient, uh, this is a photo of a patient that has this nice big metallic foreign body uh, sitting inside their vitreous uh, from a rupture. Same kind of thing on a scan. Uh, again, you can see this metallic foreign body that's there. So uh, this is something that can definitely present and not, not rarely. Other signs to be on the lookout for if you're evaluating these patients, a bullous subconjunctival hemorrhage. I mean, this is not, I think everyone has seen a routine subconjunctival hemorrhage where a patient might uh, present to you and they have a little bit of blood on the conjunctiva and that's nothing to worry about. But the patient's had an injury and has this severe subconjunctival hemorrhage, that's very worrisome. If you see any dark spots, that most likely is uvea that has prolapsed through either iris or ciliary body, as you can see here. If there's an irregularity in the shape of the pupil, that even if you don't see a rupture, that is very suspicious for a rupture globe because what can happen is there's can be a rupture over in the area where there's all this edema and the iris has actually gotten pulled to the area of the rupture and that's why you see this irregularity in the pupil. So if the pupil is not normal, even if other things look good, be suspicious for a rupture globe. Uh, if they have a hyphema or they have a vitreous hemorrhage, it may be that that's all it is, but you can't rule out that there's a rupture. And if you happen to check the intraocular pressure and it's low, that's also very concerning for a rupture globe. So what you should do if you are suspicious is once you have that suspicion, you, you can stop what you're doing. And the key thing is just protect the eye with an eye shield. You don't wanna put a patch on because you don't wanna put any pressure on the eye with a patch. So just a protective shield, good idea if you can to give them a tetanus prophylaxis and then get them to us ASAP. And there's two examples of different types of, of shields and pretty simple, just a couple pieces of tape is all it takes to, to protect the eye in this setting. And then this is a, a good example of a, of a hyphema uh, without a rupture, but uh, pretty dense hyphema after blunt trauma. As I said, assume the glow is ruptured, shield the eye, send them to us. What we do in patients with hyphemas is restrict their activity for a period of time, usually bed rest with the head of the bed elevated to allow the blood to settle out. 
we'll put them on some topical steroids, some topical cycloplegics. And usually that's all it takes. We, we have to monitor them closely to make sure we don't run into a situation where the eye pressure shoots up uh, dramatically, which can happen uh, with eye FEMA. Another type of injury that will commonly present are uh, orbital fractures. What you wanna do is assess their ocular motility. So in this patient, for example, their left eye can't elevate at all uh, due to entrapment of the inferior rectus muscle uh, within the area uh, of the fracture. It's a good idea to assess their sensation over the, the cheek and the lip to look for involvement of the infraorbital nerve. And then you can palpate. Usually if there's a fracture there, you can actually feel it uh, over the, the inferior orbit. We, our, our policy and, you know, full disclosure, this differs from the way ENT and OMFS and plastics handle these patients. But for us, we only do surgery on them if, the, uh, if they have persistent symptoms, most particularly double vision from entrapment of the muscle, or if the, the eye really has sunk in as a result. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, talk about uh, red eye and some of the more common causes that you all will see in your offices and patients who present to you and, and complain of, of a red eye. That can include mild things like a conjunctivitis, more severe things like a uveitis, a corneal infection, or acute angle closure glaucoma. Uh, viral conjunctivitis is certainly the most common, and the key here is that the discharge from the eye is usually a watery discharge, not a thick discharge. Often if it's a viral conjunctivitis, they'll have some preauricular lymphadenopathy as well that, uh, that, that you can detect. And often viral conjunctivitis is bilateral. In contrast, a bacterial conjunctivitis is a thicker discharge, a mucopurulent kind of discharge. That we do treat with topical antibiotics and some warm compresses. The viral conjunctivitis, unfortunately, like many viral diseases, there isn't much we can do other than let it run its course. We give, will give patients some symptomatic treatment, artificial tears and that type of thing just for discomfort. And then the ultimate infectious conjunctivitis is uh, GC conjunctivitis. And it's really yucky, like, uh, like you can see in this picture. And that does require treatment with systemic antibiotics in addition to topical. Allergic conjunctivitis, uh, besides for the typical allergic kind of symptoms of itching and, and tearing, if they do have discharge, it tends to be kind of a stringy kind of discharge. So that's, that's a pretty much a giveaway that this is more likely allergic in addition to the presence of other kinds of allergy kind of systemic symptoms. Those can be treated with cool compresses. We do have a variety of topical antihistamines, mast cell stabilizers, NSAIDs that we can use uh, to treat them as well. As far as the use of steroids, um, my advice would be um, in your position, don't prescribe them. Um, I would leave that to us. And the reason is that if patients don't return for follow-up, they can have complications, including cataract and glaucoma from the use of topical steroids. Or if um, they have a more severe problem going on that may not be initially detected, a herpes simplex keratitis, a corneal ulcer, those are going to be worsened substantially with the use of topical steroids. Uh, iritis, as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about uh, ankylosing spondylitis, photophobia, a deep kind of pain in the eye. This isn't like a scratchy sensation. These patients really are in pain. And classically, you can see this so-called ciliary flush, this deep injection around the, uh, the corneal limbus. Sometimes the pupil will be smaller as well because they can develop uh, some scarring uh, around the edge of the pupil. Corneal infections, I mean, this is one that I don't think anybody would miss. Uh, this is a patient with a severe pseudomonas uh, corneal ulcer. And the key thing, obviously, is to look for this infiltrate in the cornea. And, and you can often see this just with a pen light. I mean, one that's this big, you definitely can. But even smaller ones, you'll be able to see some type of opacity in the cornea. If you do have fluorescein dye and a blue light handy, these will always light up uh, with fluorescein as well. Acute angle closure is certainly another cause of a, of a red eye. And these patients are going to present with severe pain usually decreased vision, often a headache, sometimes nausea and vomiting because the eye pressure is so high, halos around lights. 
the, the classic appearances of a mi fixed mid dilated pupil. So if you do ever see that when you're checking a patient's pupils and they're having these kinds of symptoms, most likely this is an angle closure glaucoma. And then if you check their pressure, it's usually sky high. What happens in, in angle closure glaucoma is that the, the anatomy of the patient's eye is just bad and they get this apposition of the iris to the lens so that the aqueous that's being produced doesn't have a way of exiting. Ultimately, what this does is push the iris up into the, into the angle and shuts off the outflow of aqueous entirely. And so the, the aqueous just can't get out and the pressure shoots way up. Uh, there are a variety of drops that we'll use to lower the pressure and typically also we'll do a laser peripheral iridotomy to create an opening in the iris so that there's another exit route uh, for, the, uh, for the aqueous through the iris. Preceptal cellulitis is something else that, uh, that you will often encounter. These patients do have swelling and erythema of the lid, but the key thing to separate it from the more serious orbital cellulitis is that their acuity, their ocular motility, pupils, all that are normal. And if that's the case, then it's a, a preceptal cellulitis. And that can be treated conservatively. Warm compresses, some systemic antibiotics, you know, Keflex or something like that. Rarely would we need to, to image these patients. Contrast that with an orbital cellulitis, which, you know, at least externally can really look the same. But these patients have pain, they have decreased vision, they have reduction in their extraocular motility. They may have proptosis. If you look in, they can have swelling of the optic nerve. And this is a significant problem, it requires immediate treatment, IV antibiotics, uh, nasopharyngeal and blood cultures. They may need surgery, uh, orbital surgery to, to decompress the area of cellulitis. And you do always have to think about mucor as well. Zoster, big problem for you and for us. Uh, the ocular complications in zoster can really be devastating. I mean, in addition to the, the post-herpetic neuralgia, which patients can certainly get around the eye, it can cause some very significant long-term problems with the cornea, reduced corneal sensation, chronic corneal ulcers, severe dry eye, a chronic inflammation, chronic iritis. I mean, these patients can, can really be a mess. So just as a, as a brief review of the, the red eye side of things, uh, chemical injuries, angle closure glaucoma, foreign bodies, corneal abrasions, these are all just common things that can cause a red eye that we'll present to you. Uveitis, conjunctivitis, ocular surface disease like dry eye or a subconj hemorrhage. You can sort them out um, based on the symptoms. So as I mentioned, itching, most commonly allergy, burning is more commonly an eyelid disorder like blepharitis or dry eye, and we'll talk about those in a second. A foreign body sensation can be a foreign body. It can be a corneal abrasion, it can be dry eye. Localized tenderness of the lid can be an inflammation of the lid like a chalazion or a hordeolum. Deep intense pain tends to be more serious things. So scleritis, iritis, acute glaucoma. Photophobia, unfortunately, can be a lot of these things. And halos around lights, as I said, most classically, it's the acute glaucoma. Now, blepharitis, the bane of many of our existence, um, it's the inflammation of the lid margin, often associated with dry eyes. And what happens is they get this dried skin, these dried secretions uh, from the meibomian glands that are in the uh, that are in the eyelids, often associated with a low-grade staph infection. And these patients can sometimes be pretty miserable with eyelid burning, mattering of the lashes. And this is just an example of a patient with blepharitis. And you can see all of this waxy, crusty kind of material that's built up on the, on the lashes and at the base of the lids. We treat that with warm compresses, with scrub treatments to the eyelids, topical azithromycin or erythromycin. Often we'll use a course of oral doxycycline. And we do now also have some mechanical treatments that we can do to uh, debride that, that stuff from the, uh, from the edge of the eyelid, as well as express the, the thickened oils from the meibomian glands. And this is just one example of a number of devices that are out there to do this. This one's kind of nice because you can image the meibomian glands themselves. And then this also has, a, has a, an attachment that you can put on the eyelid in order to heat it up, to loosen up those oils and then remove them. 
Tears and dry eyes. So the tears really serve several functions, most importantly lubrication, but they also serve a bacteriostatic and immunologic functions on the surface of the cornea. Typical symptoms are burning, foreign body sensation. The symptoms can be made worse by a variety of things, reading, computer use, television, driving, lengthy air travel. Uh, more common as people get older, but also more common in rheumatoid, certainly in Stevens-Johnson. That means dry eye is the least of their problems in the eye. Chemical injuries, patients with pemphigoid and a variety of systemic medications. We treat that with artificial tears. We can use uh, cyclosporin drops, which are often quite effective, preservative-free tears, ointments at bedtime. We'll sometimes occlude the, the puncta to allow any tears that are produced or drops that the patient puts in to, to stay in the eye longer. And we'll talk just briefly about infectious keratitis. Uh, corneal ulcers can cause permanent scarring and decreased vision. And it's really important to detect these early and start treatment. And as I was saying, even small ulcers uh, can be detected just with a pen light. I think you'd be able to, to pick up this area here. So this is a infiltrate with overlying epithelial defect, which is the, the definition of a corneal ulcer. Herpetic keratitis uh, classically looks like this. You can stain it either with rose bengal stain or with fluorescein. And you can see the, these dendrites on the surface of the cornea. Uh, unfortunately, they're sometimes not quite this obvious, but it's nice when they are. And these are all areas where the, the cornea has been infected with active HSV. One thing that I would ask for all of these conditions that we are talking about is please, as tempting as it may be, don't prescribe topical anesthetics for these patients. You'd be surprised how often we do see this. And the reason is that with chronic use and chronic being even just frequently over a few days, the topical anesthetics can cause corneal melts. So the anesthetics themselves can cause ulceration and melting of the cornea. So my ask is, please don't use them. Um, so just to review, uh, patients that should be sent to us with red eyes, decreased vision, pain, photophobia, if you see corneal ulcers or dendrites, if the pupil's abnormal, pressure's up, or if you're suspicious of any of these really serious conditions, we need to see them right away. An orbital cellulitis, a scleritis, a chemical injury, an ulcer, acute glaucoma. Now I wanted to talk just a bit about some of the more common things that we see that, that you should be aware of because a lot of your patients are gonna have these things. The first is glaucoma, uh, more common as people get older, more common in African-Americans. Um, an elevated pressure is certainly the, the most common thing, but at risk also are patients who have first degree relatives with glaucoma, high myopes, you can get it more commonly, and diabetics. And what happens in glaucoma is that there's thinning of the nerve fibers, which we can see as changes reflected in the optic nerve. But ultimately, there's a progressive loss of the neural tissue and a loss of the visual field, beginning peripherally and then moving centrally. And that's, that's the underlying pathology in glaucoma. Initially, it's typically a nasal field loss and then gradually progresses so that it's more uh, paracentral and ultimately they can lose vision entirely. So normally what should happen is that the aqueous is produced in the ciliary body. It flows around into the anterior chamber and then flows out in the anterior chamber angle. So if there's a disruption or a change in either of those things, if there's an overproduction of aqueous in the ciliary body or something preventing normal drainage in the angle, the eye pressure can go up and lead to a glaucoma. And that's what we're showing here, that there's an overproduction and then there's something in the trabecular meshwork that's preventing drainage out of the aqueous. Screening for primary open angle glaucoma involves a, a variety of things. Most commonly, of course, checking the eye pressure, but also optic disc evaluation, which has become quite sophisticated with current technology, as well as visual field testing. So you can see in this patient progressing over the years, a nice sort of pink optic nerve with progression of glaucoma gradually becoming paler and paler as, as the years go by. 
The main testing we do now to check for glaucoma is an OCT, optical coherence tomography. And OCT is just a wonderful development because what that does is not only give us a cross-sectional picture so that we can see exactly, see the nerve fibers themselves, but also it'll measure the thickness of the nerve fibers for us. So we can tell precisely the thickness of the nerve fibers, if there's a specific area where there's any thinning, it's a wonderful tool for both detecting glaucoma and monitoring glaucoma. That being said, we do still do visual fields as well because they're, they're also valuable. And this is a patient who unfortunately has had progression of their uh, visual field loss over the years in glaucoma. So starting off with just a, a small area of peripheral loss, and you can appreciate over the years, these dark areas are all areas where there's been a loss of the visual field. And unfortunately in glaucoma, once this visual field loss occurs, it is irreversible. Uh, we use a variety of drops to, to treat glaucoma, and many of which can have systemic effects. So beta blockers, uh, I don't have to tell all of you the effects that, uh, that those can have systemically. And we do see this with, with topical use. Uh, we also use alpha agonists, which can have some systemic effects as well. Um, I typically say we don't really use cholinergic agonists anymore, but um, some of you may have seen the massive recent marketing campaign for a drug called Vuity, which is designed to uh, prevent people from needing reading glasses. All Vuity is is pilocarpine at a different concentration that has been used before. Uh, so although they don't quite mention in the marketing materials, it does have exactly the same effects that any cholinergic agonist will have, both systemically and around the eye. So uh, not, not a big fan of Vuity, but it's out there and your patients may actually ask you about it. We do use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, both systemically and topically with the you know, known potential side effects there, as well as prostaglandin analogs. The other way of treating glaucoma is with surgery, and we have a variety of really neat surgical procedures now. So we can do a variety of laser procedures to open up the, the drainage canals, uh, filtering surgery to provide a way for the aqueous to get out. And most commonly now are drainage implant procedures where whether with a tube or with a variety of other devices to provide an extra way for fluid to drain out uh, to treat glaucoma. And these are becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, it can be done really with a microsurgical kind of uh, technique now. Cataracts, um, most common cause of decreased vision in the United States. There are about a million and a half cataract surgeries done every year. A variety of causes of cataracts, the most common, of course, being age-related. What a cataract is, is a haziness that develops here within the, within the lens of the eye. Sometimes if they get bad enough, they can be pretty obvious, like in these patients, but uh, usually more subtle than that. Cataract surgery is done when because the presence of a cataract, despite what some of my colleagues may think is not the indication for cataract surgery. Cataract surgery is performed when there is a cataract and it's interfering with the activities of daily living. And when we do cataract surgery, we remove the cataractus lens and replace that with a permanent intraocular lens implant. And that's done using a technique called phacoemulsification, where there's a ultrasonic probe that we insert through a very small two and a half to three millimeter incision. Breaks the cataract up into small pieces. Those pieces are then removed through that same probe. And then, and then we put the, sorry, uh, we, ah, <laughs> we put the, the new lens in through that same three millimeter incision. It's a folded lens. So it goes in folded through that very small incision. And then we're able to open it up inside the eye. And the new intraocular lens sits in the same spot anatomically where the natural lens was located. And then the final condition I wanted to talk about is age-related macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of irreversible central vision loss among uh, people in their, in their 50s and older. Two types of ARMD, the dry form, which is not associated with choroidal neovascularization, and the wet form, which is. We'll just do it this way. Um, the dry form is the most common. 90% of the patients have the dry form, but then accounts for about 10% of the severe visual loss. These patients typically will have a slow loss of their central vision because what they get are these, what are called drusen, 
which are these deposits that build up within the retinal pigment epithelium. Ultimately, with time, these drusen will start to coalesce and cause scarring within the macula. Um, the, the best thing we have right now for the dry form are vitamins. Uh, there's a study done called the age-related eye disease study, which uh, demonstrated that a mixture of vitamins A, C, E, zinc, copper, a number of other things can reduce the conversion of the dry form to the wet form by about 50%. So that's what we do for these patients. And then the wet form, 10% of the patients, 90% of the visual loss, it typically will cause a sudden loss of central vision. The good thing is that in the past, we never had any way of treating wet macular degeneration. These are patients who just went blind. There's nothing we could do about it. Now, with the anti-VEGF injections that we talked about earlier in treating diabetes, these have done a wonderful job at treating wet macular degeneration, at least at stabilizing it and in many patients getting improvement in the vision, which is just a, a remarkable development that we've never had before.